होता है काल It is over 94 degrees, and we have smoke and fires nearby. Kind of, you know, not the best atmosphere to be living in, and breathing in. But that's where God put me. <laughs> Where has God put you today? Are you dealing with life where you're at, the way you are, as you are? Now, maybe for you that's simple. You know, you've got your support network and you've got your group together. You know, and you kind of when you get down and out, you know, you just have someone to call upon and you just go for it. You know, and you're automatically there and. You know, you have people that are praying for you, and constantly holding you up. But you know, not everyone has that, and not everyone is connected or interconnected in a tight knit bond of love and fellowship that we all are told we should have. But in the body of Christ, especially among Christians, that's not always true. You'll find that some of the loneliest people that you'll ever meet. Are right there in your own congregation, right in the midst of the place where you feel as though the joy of the Lord is your strength and all of God's blessings have come upon you. You're going to find that there are people, quite frankly, who are hurting, who are really crying out on the inside, that don't know how to express it on the outside. They're beat up. They're beat down. They have felt the consequences of their own sinfulness. And they're too embarrassed or too weak in faith to share that with anyone else because you, you know, are so holy that you look like you shine like a bright light, and they're too, too fearful to even come close to you. And that's why God sent you to go to them. You see, Jesus didn't stay with the 99. Oh, they were fine. Jesus was sent to go to the one who was desperate and needy. Even the woman at the well. With someone who no one else would have had conversation with, and yet Jesus went at the appointed time and found her. That's the way we should be. We shouldn't be looking at all those who agree with us, and all those who look like us, and all those who fellowship the same way we do. But we should be looking at the person who is hurting, the person who is in need, the person who feels beat down. I know that feeling. Most of my Christian life, it's been that way, which is why God made me the minister that I am, you know, to administer grace and mercy. Because I've been in the congregation of the mighty, I've been with the mega churches and seen how lonely it can be, how apart you can feel in the midst of a congregation of thousands and millions, where people have that ability to really wall you out. Even though you may be inside of a compact structure of walls, God created us for fellowship. Fellowship, first of all, to be with Him, to know the Father in a personal and intimate way, in a relationship that would be dynamic and that would cause us to cling to Him in a way that we would cast all our cares upon Him, for He cares for us. But then He also gave us that capacity to receive that we would give, to feel that we. Would Enjoy that we would employ His Spirit outward to everyone around us. In other words, that we would be the light of the world. Most of the people that Jesus is sending you to, if you're really paying attention to the Word of God, aren't the ones that are sitting in your congregation. They aren't the ones that are already prepared to study on their own. That really have no need except to get together to, you know, mutually congratulate each other. Or to mutually worship in some way that we're already there, so let's just celebrate. No, Jesus is out on the streets, meeting the needs of the few. Maybe God's calling you to that. It's not an easy road. It'll beat you down. It'll beat you up. 
if you want to be like the Son of Man, it will crucify your heart, your soul, and literally tear your flesh apart. Because that's what God did for you. That's what Jesus did for me. That's how God came to us in the flesh. To be ripped apart by humanity and all of its needs, all of its misunderstandings, misconceptions, and even false ideas and theologies. And so they took God and nailed him to a cross and committed deicide. They killed God. And yet, he lives. I, at times, get burdened with what I see in the body of Christ, with what I feel from the universal church at large, with what I know is coming upon the world and the millions and billions that will die. And I get beat down. And I get stomped on to the ground. And I feel the weight of all those souls who are perishing. And it bothers me. Because I see my own selfishness and selfish desires and things that I want to do as opposed to what God would choose to use me to do. It's not easy following Jesus. You see, it's simple to be a Christian. It's easy to be in the religion that we call Christianity. But it's quite another thing to follow Jesus wherever He goes to do whatever He does, to live the way the Son of Man died. I don't know about you, but sometimes I get exhausted, burned out almost from all of that weight of my own cross to bear, from the choices that I've made that I dare to exercise my faith in a certain direction that I want to see Jesus on the street like I have so I want to see Jesus in the eyes of the person who's desperate for hope. And you reach out a hand and you hug them, irregardless of the fact that they're full of flies or maggots, that they may be disgusting and dirty. But you hug them anyways. You don't fear for AIDS or any kind of communicable disease. You just love them. Because that's what Jesus did. Sometimes it's heavy and hard to walk like the song said, he ain't heavy, he's my brother. But Cain, when he saw Abel, said, am I my brother's keeper? And he challenged God on that. Jesus comes back to us in the same way and challenges us with greater than what Cain said to Abel, or to God about Abel. Jesus comes to us and says, love your enemy. Bless those who persecute you. Comfort those who miserably and despitefully use you. It's not easy to be a Christian. It's not a bed of roses that we're supposed to just simply walk away and get our way because we walked away from where Jesus was ministering today. We could turn our back on those that are homeless we may find something more real than we ever imagined. We could say to ourselves, they're one of the 99 that are just wanting a free ride. We're not willing to take the time to get to know that person and look them in the eye and help them and bring them home and bind up their wounds. We're not willing to be the Good Samaritan. Or are we? What is your church doing today about the issues we face in the reality of God's grace being poured out upon this land as we are the wealthiest nation in existence. Our per capita people are the wealthiest nation there ever was. Per capita. If you counted every single citizen and added up the monies that we are able to do with and use, we are the wealthiest nation in the history of the world. Per capita. What are we doing with that grace we've been given?
he has made me an everlasting covenant, ordered in all things and sure. I know whom I have believed, and am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I have committed unto him against that day. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Jesus, according as he has chosen us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love, having predestined us into the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will. We know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to his purpose, for whom he did foreknow he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his Son. Moreover, whom he did predestinate, them he also called, and whom he called, them he also justified, and whom he justified, he also glorified. God has done his part. The question we need to ask ourselves every day, are we doing our part? 